Hello, BC Calculus students. This is Mr. Johnson, and we are in the second video for section 8.4. We're talking about um, the ninth convergence test, which is on absolute convergence, and this is on page 53. So we're right in the middle of the page. We did the example number six um, in, the, in the last video, and now we're going to jump into this idea of absolute convergence. And this idea can be a little bit confusing at first. It's um, very important how how you um, uh, work with the terminology. And so that's the part that I'm going to try to stress, and I'm going to try to show you the different elements of that. So first of all, we've been talking about simply just convergence and divergence up to this point with series. And we're going to dive into now the ninth test, which talks about the idea of absolute convergence. And along with absolute convergence, we have to also discuss the possibility of conditional convergence. And so um, I'm going to I'm going to come back to the harmonic and the alternating harmonic in a moment. Let's just take a look at the test really quickly. So the ninth test is on absolute convergence, and it says that a series a sub n is called absolutely convergent if the series of the absolute values. So in other words, if you take the absolute value of a sub n um, is convergent. OK, so in other words, if a series is convergent, and doesn't converge when we take the absolute value of terms, the series is conditionally convergent. However, if a series is convergent and it still is convergent when we take the absolute value of terms, the series is absolutely convergent. So up to this point, we've looked at, for example, let's move up to the information right above. We've looked at the, the alternating harmonic, for example. So the alternating harmonic is going to be the series negative 1 to the n over n as n goes from 1 to infinity. And we've said that this is a convergent series, which is still true. Nothing has changed there. So this is convergent. We now know that there's a reason for this, <clears throat> excuse me. We have the eighth test, which is the um, alternating series test. So we could say that this is convergent, not just by memory now or by definition, but by the alternating series test. Okay, so we, we know that it's convergent. Now the question is, what if we had to determine whether or not the alternating harmonic is either conditionally convergent or it's absolutely convergent. And so what we would do with this is that we would take the alternating um, harmonic, and actually I'll, I'll move over here, and we would take the absolute value of the terms. Now think about it for a moment. If you took the alternating harmonic and you applied the absolute value, you would get the uh, harmonic series, which is simply just the series one over n. Now we know this is divergent, partially due to just the definition because we've talked about the harmonic and how it's divergent, but we can also claim that it's high, uh, um, divergent by the p-series test. Okay, so let's go with our definition that we have below. So we have a series, the alternating harmonic, that is convergent, but it doesn't converge when we take the absolute value of terms because when we take the absolute value of the harmonic series, we get the harmonic series, which is divergent, and therefore the alternating harmonic is conditionally convergent based on our definition from series test number nine. So we're going to put conditionally convergent. Okay, again, the, the, uh, the concept is a little bit challenging, so we're going to dive into um, a couple other problems <clears throat> and try to organize the idea of absolutely convergent and conditionally convergent. So let's look at the uh, next page. Oh, and let me just outline really quickly this, this idea at the bottom. It says if a series is absolutely convergent, then the original series must also be convergent. However, if a series is convergent, it does not have to be absolutely convergent. So what this test allows us to do is it allows us to apply the absolute value and test convergence. If we apply the absolute value, and we find that the series is convergent, that means that the original was as well. However, if we apply the absolute value and it diverges, we have to go back and test the original. So it allows us to test series that are a little bit different or a little bit more challenging than we've had up to this point. And I'll try to show you some examples in just a moment. Let's go on to the next page. 
Okay, we're looking at example seven now. It says, consider the series, is it absolutely convergent? So <clears throat> let's take a look at the uh, absolute value of the terms. So we have n is equal to one to infinity. We're gonna apply the absolute value. So we have negative one to the n minus one divided by n squared. And obviously if we apply the absolute value, we are gonna eliminate the alternator. That alternator will just become one now. So it's one over n squared. And this is convergent by the P-series test. So when we take the absolute value of the terms, we get a series that is convergent, in this case by the P-series test, then we can uh, state that the original is not only also convergent, but is absolutely convergent. So again, let me just reiterate. So when we state that this original series is absolutely convergent, what we mean by this is that this the original series that we have given in the problem is convergent. By the way, we could prove that it's convergent by the alternating series test. Keep in mind when I say that series is convergent, I'm not claiming Alter, uh, absolute convergence or conditional convergence. I'm just claiming simple convergence. So what I'm claiming is that this series is convergent, which is one of the meanings behind absolutely convergent, but also that the absolute value of the terms is convergent. So again, absolute convergence is just another way of possibly showing convergence. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Now, in this case, um, it's difficult to, to apply a different test to this problem because as you list terms, so for example, let's say that n is equal to one. So we have cosine of one over n squared. Cosine of one is positive. Oh, sorry, back up. Cosine of one over one squared, so one. Um, the uh, value of cosine of one is positive, okay? The next term would be cosine of two over two squared, which is four, and cosine of two, you can check the graph or you can look at your calculator, is negative. So, so far we have an alternating series. The next term is cosine of three over three squared, so nine. It happens that cosine of three is also negative. And again, you can check your calculator or you can just think about um, the graph of cosine. So all of a sudden we have a positive term and then a negative term and then a negative term. No longer is this an alternating series. This has signs that alternate, but it doesn't fit the category of an alternating series, which means that the alternating series test is out. So when you think about this particular series, it's not geometric, and all of the other seven tests that we had in the beginning are for positive series or positive terms for a series. So this particular one, we're really stuck with any of the other eight tests. We need the ninth test. We need the uh, absolute convergence test. If we were to do one more term, cosine of four uh, over 16, that happens to also be negative. So in this particular case, we have a unique series that has alternating signs, but not necessarily every other term, okay? So we're gonna take the series itself and take the absolute value of the terms. However, the challenge here is that we don't just eliminate cosine, because remember cosine is not it's not either negative one or one. Cosine is uh, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but the values are not necessarily just one. And so we have this um, numerator that varies. And the problem is that we can't just eliminate this and get, for instance, one over n squared because it's not necessarily just one. So we need to compare this to another series. And the series I'm gonna compare this to is the series one over n squared. Now, if we think about cosine, and if we were to take the absolute value, the smallest value can be a zero, and the largest value is gonna be one. What that means then is that because cosine is either between zero and one, my uh, series on the left is actually less than the series on the right. Now the series on the right is convergent by the P-series test with P equal to two, and that's greater than one. 
And so what we could say here is that since this particular series is convergent, and I've already stated the test there, then the series from one to infinity of uh, the absolute value of cosine of n over n squared is convergent by the comparison test. Therefore, the original cosine of n over n squared is absolutely convergent, meaning that it is convergent, period. Okay, so when the question says, does this converge or diverge, the answer is that it converges. Not only that, it's absolutely convergent. But again, if something is absolutely convergent, it is also just simply convergent. All right, let's move on to example nine. Which of the following are conditionally convergent? So remember, conditional convergence means that the series is convergent, but if you take the absolute value of terms, it is no longer convergent, similar to the harmonic series, which we have as number one. So this first one fits the mold. We already talked about it. That is convergent by the alternating series test. However, if you take the absolute value, it's the harmonic, which means it's divergent. So we already talked about that one. We don't talk about that one again. Let's talk about number two. So if we applied the um, alternating series test, so number one, does it alternate? Yes. Does uh, Do the, the non-alternating terms decrease? So in other words, you're looking at, uh, let's just call it b sub n equal to 1 over n cubed. So as you list terms, every term you list is smaller than the previous term. So does it decrease? Absolutely. Uh, number three, is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n cubed 0? And the answer is yes. So First off, it's convergent by the alternating series test. Okay, so we know for sure that it converges. The question now is, does it converge if we take the absolute value of terms? So I'm going to just do this below, I suppose. So we have the original. However, we're going to take the absolute value of the terms giving us the series 1 over n cubed. That one is convergent by the p-series test. Therefore, the original series is not only convergent, but when we take the absolute value of terms, it's also convergent, meaning that this original series that we have for number two is absolutely convergent. So number two is out. That is not conditionally convergent. That is absolutely convergent. All right, let's take a look at number three. So we have number three, and this one is uh, alternating. Check on that list, number two. Um, if you look at b sub n, which is equal to one over the square root of n, does it decrease? So does every ter term, uh, is every term smaller than the previous? The answer is absolutely yes. And is the limit as n goes to infinity? Zero, and the answer is yes. So this is convergent by the alternating series test. Okay, remember, that doesn't tell us anything about convergence or absolute convergence yet. That just tells us it's convergent. Okay, just simply put. All right, let's take the absolute value of terms. So we apply the absolute value, giving us the series from one to infinity of one over square root n. Uh, if it is helpful, that is the same thing as one over n to the one half power. That means p is one half. That means we have a divergent series. Uh, let's do a divergent series by the p series test because p is one half and that is less than one and that's going to be divergent okay now what does this mean well remember the original 
is convergent by the alternating series test. However, the absolute value of terms is divergent. That means that this is conditionally convergent, which is exactly what the problem is asking for. And so our answer is going to be 1 and 3, which is letter C. Okay, let's move on to the next page. All right, we're going to do example 10. And example 10 is a little bit challenging because um, we, we sort of need to revert back to the conversation we had in the last video where there was that problem about the Taylor series. And I started talking about the center of convergence and the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence. And so this is an idea that we're starting to slowly build. And this is one of the central um, concepts in the next half of chapter eight. So first off, we're told that there's a power series. Again, a power series is a term that we're slowly introducing. We talked about it a little bit with geometric series, and it comes up now when we start talking about convergence conditionally, absolutely, and so on. So don't be too confused about a power series quite yet. Um, power series is going to be a polynomial representation, basically. But either way, what we have is a sub n, which is just a series generator times x minus 1 to the power of n. Now, um, again, we talked about the center of convergence. Uh, when you have a power series, so maybe this is sort of just a side note here, um, and I'll remind you about this again later. But if you have a power series, it's going to be in the form of this generally. Okay. Now, it might look different, but it's going to be generally that form. And the, the um, a sub n is going to be just the, um, the series generator as you work through every single term. X is going to be the variable of change, which means that you're going to have some sort of integral. I'm sorry, some sort of interval, and X will fit on a certain interval, which will cause either convergence or divergence. The one thing I want to really point out that's really important is that this is going to be representative of the center. So in other words, in this problem, the center is often called A, but it doesn't need to be, okay? So don't, don't worry about that. If it's called something different, that's fine. But A is going to be equal to 1. In other words, if you plug in 1, you get 0. That's going to be the center of this particular series. So we have a center at 1. I'm going to draw a little picture to try to help us analyze this problem. And, um, and this is a really important concept, and we'll do a few more like this. So we have a center at 1. And we have information about x equals 5. So 2, 3, 4. OK, that's going to be 5. And let's do 0, 1, negative 1, negative 2. And then that's going to be, let's see, uh, 0, 1. Two. OK, so that's negative 3. Here's negative 4. OK, <clears throat> so did I count that right? 0, negative 1, negative 2. Negative three, yes. Okay, so we're told that there's conditional convergence here at five. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're, we're really being told indirectly something about the interval of convergence. So in this particular case, we know that if, if there's a series that is convergent at five in this example, and it's conditional, that means that everything in between one and five, in, in between the center and five is convergent. It has to be by definition. However, if you move the same amount of space out on the other side of the interval, so in other words, if, if you're looking at going, let's say here, out to negative three, which would be the same length, at three, it will not be convergent because at five, it's conditional convergence. So conditional convergence means that that's kind of the end of your interval. And on the opposite side of the interval, there's going to be divergence. So in other words, in this problem, they're telling us that the interval of convergence is when x is in between 5 and negative 3. Sorry, I wrote that wrong. Hold on here. We're not including negative 3. So 5 and negative 3. 5 is included because there's conditional convergence, and negative 3 is not included because of the fact that 5 is conditional. 
that would then guarantee that three negative three is open or divergent. Okay. Now the question is asking us for what is true about negative four. Well, since we know that five is conditionally convergent, and since we now know that that uh, the interval of convergence is in between negative three and five, where negative three is not included and five is included, and one is the center, we know that at at negative four there is divergence because it is outside of the interval of convergence. So the answer is gonna be C. This concept is, is pretty deep and it's gonna take a little while to grasp. So um, we'll continue to work on this idea more and more. And I'll talk about the radius of convergence again in a little bit. Okay, let's try example uh, 11. So 11 says, which of the following is absolutely convergent? So remember, we're looking for specifically if we take the absolute value, is a convergence. So we're not gonna waste time looking at any individual ones as they're written. We're just gonna simply take the absolute value right away because we don't care about the first one. We just care about what happens when you get rid of the alternator. This is divergent by the P-series test. The next one is one over its square root of n or n to the one half. We already talked about one really similar to that. That's divergent. Same thing by the p-series test. Next one, we have the uh, series with n over n plus one. And the first thing I would do is take the limit of this, which is n over n plus one, which is one. That is not equal to zero, so that's gonna be divergent. That would be technically the nth term test or our very first test. And then the last one, take the absolute value and you get one half to the power of n. And we're really hoping this is the answer because we basically said a, b, and c are gone. This is convergent by the geometric series test because r, which is one half, the absolute value of that is less than one, which is our definition of convergence. So that's gonna be letter D. Okay, that does it for this video. The next video will be on the ratio test, your very last test. Thank you.